Okay. Hi, everybody. Hi, nice to see you again. This is great. 30 years. Can you imagine that? We're, uh, we're going to have a lot of fun this, this week, weekend. And I know that everybody's going to get to meet new people and enjoy the times with uh, people we already know. And I just love to look at your faces. This is great. <clears throat> well, the theme of this, this um, institute is their sound hath gone forth into all the earth and their words unto the ends of the world. So in the past few years, we have done our themes here at the Sacred Music Institute on uh, Great Lent. We've done Holy Week. We've done Pascha. And we said, what's next? Well, what's next is Ascension and Pentecost. But where we had enough music for all of that was another story. Is that from me? It worked fine when it was on me. No, we had that too. Oh, did we? Yeah. I don't know. Okay. I don't know where it's coming from, but is that this one? What's that? <laughs> Excuse me. All right. for technical difficulties. <laughs> okay. Just in case. So we've done Holy Week, we've done Pascha, and, and so now we're kind of focusing on Pentecost. Pentecost is the feast where the Holy Spirit comes down from heaven and inspires the apostles, and we see the tongues of fire coming upon them. They speak in all kinds of languages, and they go forth into the world and proclaim the good news of what they had just celebrated and experienced with Jesus Christ in this world. They lived with him, they talked with him, they ate with him, they suffered with him, they saw him die on the cross, they saw, and they experienced his resurrection from the dead, and they were amazed. It was totally amazing. Can you imagine being back there at that time? Having to look at someone as a fellow human being Seeing him for not who he really was as just a human being, but seeing and discovering that he was truly the Son of God incarnate. It's amazing and to trust his words, to listen to him, and to be so inspired that you're willing to go against everything that the world was teaching and doing and understanding and believing and say, no, we don't worship pagan gods. We don't worship the Roman gods. We have Jesus Christ. We have God himself right here with us and to know that that might eventually lead into your death. That's really something when you think about it. So Pentecost is really the empowering of all of us to do and to be what God has called us to do and to be. He empowers us. He gives us the grace of the Holy Spirit to come upon us so that we can go forth into that world and proclaim. So when we hear these words, their sound has gone forth into all the earth and their words to the end of the world. What do we think of? Who does it normally apply to in the church when we say those words? Apostles. To the apostles. Right. Because they were the ones that Jesus said, go forth into all the world, baptize the nations in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and make disciples, make them teachers and learners and help them to come to know salvation through Jesus Christ. To know it. Well, would you be surprised to hear that those words in their original context have nothing to do with the apostles? Has nothing to do with the apostles. This is the uh, Septuagint version of it. <coughs> it's from Psalm, well, in the, Sept in the Septuagint numbering 18, or in your normal Bibles, 19. Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament proclaims the work of his hands. Day unto day poureth forth speech, and night unto night proclaimeth knowledge. There are no tongues nor words in which their voices are not heard. Their sound has gone forth into all the earth, and their words unto the ends of the world. So what is it talking about? 
Let me read the other version, the RSV version. The heavens are telling the glory of God, and the firmament pro proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night declares knowledge. There is no speech, there are no words, their voice is not heard, yet their voice goes out into all the earth and their words to the end of the world. So what is it referring to? Exactly, the heavens are proclaiming the glory of God. The heavens are speaking volumes. Day to day and night to night is pouring forth of knowledge and understanding. It's like, you know, a thousand pic or a, a picture paints a thousand words. You look at the heavens and you're amazed. We're amazed. And we can hear God speaking to us through all of his creation, through what we experience. And St. Paul even talked about that in, in the first chapter of Romans when he says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and wickedness of men who by their wickedness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. Ever since the creation of the world, his invisible nature, namely his eternal power and deity, has been clearly perceived in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. And then it goes on and on about other things. So when we look at the heavens, we can understand God. When we look at creation, we can understand the glory of God, the love of God. And you know, even driving down here on Tuesday, yesterday, you know, I, I left Detroit and I put the news on. I was listening to what's going on in the world and you always, oh, man, I can't understand the world anymore. And then it started getting crackly because I'm getting far away from Detroit, so I turn it off. I open my windows, and I'm just driving, and I'm looking, and it's beautiful. The rain was coming down, and it's beautiful. <laughs> and then you get into Pennsylvania, and the trees, and the glory, and you say, O oh Lord, how man manifold are thy works, and wisdom hast thou made them all. It's so beautiful. It really is. And that's how we understand God. That's how he revealed himself to us initially. It was through the heavens, the glory and the firmament and the proclaiming his majesty and glory. Do you, and I want to give you an, just a little example. Do you remember, anybody see that King Kong movie with Naomi Watts and um, Adrian Brody. Brody and Jack Black, right? Do you remember when King Kong, do you ever, who saw the movie? Some of you, just a few? Ah. It's really a good movie. The rest of us were in church. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, let me just give you one part of it. You know the story, the history, the, kind of the, the, the main aspect of King Kong. You know, this girl gets captured, and, and he falls in love with her, kind of gets really attracted to her. And she's, well, in this particular, in this particular movie, you know, she's, uh, she's an actress and a dancer. She's trying to do all kinds of things initially to, to like, uh, you know, just get, get his attention. Well, at one point, part towards the middle of the movie or so, uh, she's trying to escape, actually. And she starts running away, and that's when the dinosaurs come. And then she gets all fearful. And the dinosaurs, I mean like T-Rex, is trying to chase her. Well, King Kong then, he hears her. And he comes flying through the trees and he, and he picks her up and he's fighting with the other hand, holding her, throwing her around, fighting the other way with King Kong, with, uh, with the dinosaurs. Well, to make a long story short, okay. He gets through everything, he defeats the dinosaurs and he gets her, say, he saves her from everything. And then he goes off and he's like really beaten up because the dinosaur was beaten on him too. He got really beat up. So he's kind of walking slow and he goes back and away. And she's like wondering where he goes. And he, she comes to find him sitting on the edge of a cliff, just looking out. And she's looking at him. She doesn't understand. Like, he's just sitting there. And she starts trying to get his attention. So she's doing these kind of dances, and she's flips and juggling and all kinds of stuff. And he's not budging. He's not moving. He's not even doing anything. He's just looking. And finally, 
finally she looks at him and looks where he's looking and she turns around and looks to what he's looking at. He's looking out west at the sunset. It is so absolutely beautiful. And she just sits down next to him. And you can just imagine what, was, what, what he, as a creature, that they were trying to get across to us, as a creature was, was feeling and experiencing the glory and majesty of God just by looking at the sunset. And she finally realized it too. Can you imagine, as I thought about David, King David, writing this psalm, was he doing the same thing? Was he looking around and just sitting there one night at a sun, or a morning, a sunrise or a sunset, and what he may have experienced? And he thinks to himself, inspired by God, and he writes, the heavens are telling, declaring the glory of God, and the firmament proclaims his handiwork. Wow, day by day and day forth day uh, proclaims speech, and night to night proclaims knowledge. There's no words. There's no voice. Yet the sound has gone forth into all the earth. And whatever is being proclaimed is going forth to the end of the world. Well, that's what our theme is this, this, uh, this year. That's what we're here for, to understand and to contemplate, to think about, <clears throat> to talk about, to celebrate. It shows that as we experience God, that it's the word of God that's being proclaimed. It's his word. He proclaims it through the heavens. He proclaims it through his creation. He proclaims it through his very son who came down from heaven as the word of God. Because if we didn't understand it that way and really understand God's presence with us, he sends his son to give us the words himself, the word himself to speak to us and to show us in word and deed the majesty of God. And then he passes that on to the apostles. And then the church sees it. Hey, yeah, their sound, their sound now is going to go forth into all the earth and their words are going to proclaim the glory of God to the end of the ages. So now it's from the creation to the Son of God himself, to the apostles, and on Pentecost, he proclaims it and gives it to us. Pentecost then now proclaims, okay, guys, I did it. I created the world. I gave you life. You kind of messed it up a little. <laughs> okay, well, I sent my son to fix it. He died. He rose again. Okay, he did it all for you. Now, here's the Holy Spirit. You are now empowered. Okay, it's your turn. Go and do it. Go and proclaim. Go and celebrate. Take it to the ends of the world and let the world know that God's glory is above all, that he is our Father, that he is our God, and that he loves us, and he wants to be there with us. It's our turn. That's what it's about. And so we do. We proclaim his glory, and we sing his praises. That's what we're here for. Um, Sometimes, I mean, what I was thinking, too, on the way over was when I did turn the radio off and just looked at the majesty of what I was driving through in this world of ours, in this United States. I've never been to Europe. People that come and go over there and come back and tell me about it, it's really magnificent just to hear about what's there. You know, more glory of God. And all throughout the whole world that you can imagine how God has created this world. And then you look up at the heavens. And sometimes when I go to work, it's dark, or I get out of work and it's dark, because I work 12-hour shifts. And, you, and I can see the stars, and I'll look them up. And then I'll tell people, oh, see those two stars, the bright ones? That one's Jupiter and that one's Venus. I mean, you look at the world and the universe. And I have this picture on my computer of the galaxy, of the Milky Way galaxy, with it just swirling and around the stars. And, there's no way that any of us could have created any of that. That's the glory of God proclaiming his majesty 
throughout all the ages for anyone to see. And how many people throughout all of these centuries of this life that we've been on this earth have started to understand that and make sense of it and to proclaim it? It's got to be hard because there are people who will not listen. There are people in this world who will, who will damage our words, who will not allow us to speak, who will uh, you know, uh, really change what we're saying and misunderstand it or denigrate it. And how many times have I heard in my lifetime when I start to say something and then someone will say to me, well, that's what you believe. <laughs> and I say, yeah, it is what I believe. Yeah, but that's what you believe. That's your truth. It's not my truth, they say. Uh, you know, what that means then is that life is relative. I can say, Jesus is the Son of God. You could say, no, he's not. We can't both be right. He either is or he isn't. And as some of the people in the past centuries looked at Jesus and they said, well, he either is the Son of God and made sense and did all those miracles, or he was a lunatic. Really, he was just trying to push something over on us and didn't make any sense at all. You can't both be right. There is, I guess what I'm saying here is, there is eternal truth. There is an absolute eternal truth. And as we take this sound of our faith, this voice of our faith, the words of our faith, and go forth into the world, we have to understand that. Not in a demeaning way when we talk to others, not in a, in a, um, a pushy way or a demanding way, because I'll, I'll kind of back, not back down, but I'll say, okay, that is what I believe. But do you know something? In the end, all will come to know that Jesus is the incarnate Son of God, the Messiah, the Christ. All will come to know that in the end. All of us. Some of us are already believing that. Some of us are coming to understand that. I have uh, my son, my oldest son, Nick, is dating a, a, a lady who has never been baptized. And she's coming to understand things. She asks me a lot of questions, and I give her blogs and blogs, as I'm told now. I never knew what that word was. <laughs> <You know. clears throat> They, they send me questions and I write three or four pages back and my, my son will say, you know, Dad, that was a great, you should put that on, the, on a, like an internet, like a blog page. And, What's a blog? <laughs> <laughs> but that, people are coming to understand that. They really are discovering it. And I also, this past year, and one of the reasons why I was uh, so uh, encouraging to Paul and to the bishop to pass on this chairmanship, was because I went through a chaplaincy program. And it was a wonderful program from November to June. And I, it was really the first unit of this program. It's clinical pastoral education. It's called CPE. And all seminarians are required to do it now. It's a great program. It's a, the first unit was about really self-awareness. And you're learning about yourself as a person, as a minister, uh, and how to interact with people and such. Well, you know, in doing so at a hospital, when you're a chaplain, you have to understand people of all faiths because we minister to everyone. Everyone gets sick. Whether you're a Christian, whether you're Western or Eastern Christian, whether you um, uh, follow Judaism, whether you follow uh, Islam, the Islamic faith, whether you follow Buddhist faith, we had Buddhists, we had atheists, agnostics, and you talk about something that's really hard to understand because I'm not there to preach. I'm not there to proselytize and to get someone to be converted to the Christian faith or orthodoxy. No, I'm there to comfort them in their sickness. But when you ask them how do they get through their illness, what inspires them? Do you believe in God? Oh, no, I don't believe in God. <laughs> it's like, what? okay, let me retrain my brain here because I, you know, you're not used to that. But you have to be because that's where you have to meet people where they're at and then help to take them somewhere. 
And what did the apostles have to do in the early days? They had to meet the pagans. They had to interact with them on their level and help them to understand what they had just experienced. And they had to take that message throughout the world to people who had never heard of Jesus. Never heard of God, maybe. They were pagans. They had a different understanding. But I grew and I developed a very deep appreciation for people of other faiths, Christian and non-Christian alike. It was wonderful because I see people and I saw people really struggling to come to know God in their own way. But what I'm saying is, in the end, we all will come to know that Jesus is the Christ. So in this part here, just remember that, you know, there is an eternal truth. We may, may not be able to convince people of that because they always think, well, that's what you believe. It's not what I believe. Okay, fine. What do you believe? Ask them that question. Okay, then if that's not what you believe, what do you believe? Where are you in your faith? Or any faith at all. What gets you through the day? Why do you wake up in the morning? And maybe that way we can start to proclaim what we've been asked to proclaim, what we've been empowered with by the Holy Spirit to go forth and do. In uh, Romans chapter 10, St. Paul talks also about this kind of con this concept. Because everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. But how are men to call upon him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without a preacher? And how can men preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So, says St. Paul, faith comes from what is heard. And what is heard comes by the preaching of Christ. But I ask, have they not heard? Indeed they have, for their voice has gone out to all the earth and their words to the end of the world. And again, I ask, did Israel not understand? First Moses says, I will make you jealous of those who are not a nation. With a foolish nation, I will make you angry. Then Isaiah is so bold as to say, I have been found by those who did not seek me. I have shown myself to those who did not ask for me. Meaning like the Gentiles. God came to the Israelites. He gave them the law. He gave them himself. He gave them instruction. He was there with them by the pillar, of the cloud and the fire by night, the cloud by day, the fire by night. And, but there were others who came to discover, even though, you know, originally they weren't even supposed to be seeking, but they found God. They came to know him. But the point here is that what's, what St. Paul is saying is that we need to be those people who are going out into the world to proclaim the good news. It has to be our voice, but it's not our voice. It's God's voice. Remember what he told the disciples? He said, when you go out and proclaim, he said, don't worry about what you're going to say. The Holy Spirit will guide you. Well, that's when we were empowered, was on the day of Pentecost. He empowered us. He gave us that Holy Spirit. And so now it's our turn to go out and proclaim the word of God. Now there also is how we can do it. It's not easy. It's not easy to be the word of God. And it's not just in words. It's in our deeds. If they see who we are, if we see the love and the compassion that we can give to one another, they'll understand the word of God. If they see the kindness that we show to one another, the forgiveness that we can give, the patience we can show, the understanding of other people and where they're at, doesn't mean we need to agree with them always. We don't always have to agree with where they're at, but we can understand where they're at. And we can meet them there and help to lead them, maybe not in a day or a week, or a month or a year, who knows? 
but we can be a presence. And that's what he's calling us to do and to be. We are empowered. St. Paul says in Ephesians 5, Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery. That is like corruption. But be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody. That word making melody in Greek is psalming it. It is. <laughs> we make up a word here. Psalming it. Go out and, uh, and uh, you know, addressing one another in spiritual songs and singing and psalming to the Lord with all your heart, always and for everything, giving thanks in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God the Father. So we continue to sing his praises and glorify his name. And our voice can go out into, the, into all the ends of the ages when we as a community can inspire others through our music. And that's also why we're here, because of the music. We don't just get up and say, glory to God in the heavens. We might sing it in a most magnificent and beautiful way. But it has to be that inspiring, because we've been filled with the Spirit to be inspiring. So when I walked into my uh, church in, in Chicago and I became the director over there, they were singing the liturgy, and they were doing the best that they could. But they would sing, Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. He's smiling. So I would say, okay, who knows what Alleluia means? Do you guys know what Alleluia is? Like, like something big, you know? It's like praise God. Yes, yeah, I'm sorry, I just said it. Yeah, it means praise God. Alleluia. And I said, okay, how are you praising God by singing Alleluia? <laughs> I mean, and they looked at you, oh, okay, now I'm going to give you the chord. Now I want you to sing it with life. And boy, every Sunday, I would look at them when, they, when, he, when the priest would say, Peace be to thee that read us, and I would look at that. <laughs> and they would come all, and it would shake the rafters, I swear. And I loved it. Oh, it was so beautiful, because that's what's inspired. That's what can really capture the, the people to be filled with the glory of God. And to understand that, and to be motivated and, and really moved by their presence in church with him who gave us this life. And I know some of you have heard this story, but I have to tell it again because I see new faces. I didn't tell it last year. I was director of, uh, when back then when they were regions, the Midwest region, and I had just finished my first year in seminary. And I came home for that summer and it was the, the convention, I don't remember what city, I think it was Chicago, um, but I went I was the Midwest Region Choir Director. And so we get to the convention, starting on Thursday, Thursday morning, and I'm trying to get the choir together. It's the first liturgy, first time we're all singing together. We haven't had any rehearsals. Here's the books, you know, standard books, the same ones we have today. <laughs> and I'm looking at my choir, and I see 80 sopranos, <laughs> and maybe a couple of everybody else. Okay, let's do it the best we can. So it was hard. You know, I was kind of a new director and trying to get them motivated and moving along and go, just going. And Metropolitan Philip, God rest his soul, was up in the front with the whole, I mean, Midwest was a, is a big region. So there's a lot of clergy up front. And they're all the big sea of black up in front. And they're going through the liturgy and we get through the antiphons and we get through the Trisagian hymn and it's in... You know, we get through everything. They come to the great entrance. We're doing the cherubic hymn. And right at the end of the cherubic hymn, Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. And I cut. Okay, now we're going to the next page for the, uh, for the uh, litanies. And Deacon Hans, I know you know Deacon Hans was Metropolitan Phillips. He, he comes up to me. And just as the priest is going on, you know, uh, let us complete and all this, and we're getting ready. And Chris. <clears throat> <laughs> The bishop is very displeased. He wants you to stop singing. And it, like, let us complete our prayer to the Lord. And they're all looking at me. I said, 
So I said, who's going to do it? And well, right then, the clergy started with the Lord have mercies. Then they finished the liturgy. So, you know, I'm thinking like, okay. <laughs> At the end of liturgy, the bishop welcomes everybody. Welcome to the clergy. I want to see the clergy afterwards to get your organization for the rest of the week. And Christopher Hillway, I want to see you too. <laughs> okay. So everybody leaves, kisses the cross, they all leave, and it's me and the clergy. And I stand there. First thing he says, Chris, he says, do you know what the word dynamis means? And I'm thinking, dynamis, dynamis. I'm a first-year seminarian. Dynamis, dynamis. <laughs> dynamis sounds like dynamite, you know? Okay. Um, I don't know, strength, power, I don't know. And he says, yes, you're right. And do you know something, Chris? There was no dynamis this morning. <laughs> but do you know something? That inspired me for the rest of my days as a choir director, as a person, as a priest, as whatever you know, I could do to motivate people. It doesn't mean that everything has to be loud and fast, but it has to be filled with the Spirit. And we have differences in our hymns. You know that the, uh, the Trisagan hymns are sung a particular way. The Trisagan hymn, Holy God, it's sung in a particular way. But when we get to the Cherubic hymns, they're much softer and they're much slower, much slower. Nice and gentle. We who just take your time. And it, it just fills you in a, in a much different way. And then when you get to the anaphora, it has its own flavor, its own tempo and tone and style that you can inspire someone with that kind of music, with those words that are there for that particular time. And so my point to you is that as we go forth into this world, as we proclaim the glory of God, as we take His words and are empowered by the Holy Spirit to go forward into this world, to proclaim His good news, to share that glory with those, to sing His praises in the ways that we know best, whether it's chanting or with a choir, let it be filled with the Spirit. Let there be a dynamis there. Let there be an empowerment there, the strength of the Holy Spirit to proclaim it so we can capture the hearts of people and we can motivate them to be inspired themselves so that they too can then go forth into all the world and to the end of the ages. Let them be inspired so their sound, which is God's sound, which is God's voice, which is God's word being proclaimed from the heavens, the firmament, the creation, the sun, to the apostles, to all of us, to the world. That's why we're here. I hope and pray that God will so inspire every one of us to do all of that, to be empowered, to realize what talents we have, to realize what purpose we have and not to be afraid of it. Just like they weren't in the early centuries. We may not literally have to give up our lives in the sense of dying, being beheaded like they were back then or being crucified, but we have our own forms of persecution in this day and age. But know that you're not alone. We can make it happen because God is with us. Thank you.